Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Monterey Leadership Forum. We meet every Wednesday, and we're so happy to be back here again this week with a very special guest. My name is Kathy Leach, and on behalf of the International Monterey Council and the Monterey Foundation, I'm happy to be your host today. I'm joined by several of our colleagues, as I generally am. I have with us uh, Jonathan Wolf. Jonathan is a senior consultant with the Miles Ray Foundation, an IMC board member, international workshop presenter, author, and poet. So thanks for being here with us again, Jonathan. Uh, Tanya Reiskind is our, uh, so, uh, so sorry, I'm tripping over my words. <laughs> Tanya Reiskind is head of school of our lab school, the uh, in Sarasota, Florida, the Newgate School, and she also works uh, as a consultant with the Monterey Foundation. Tanya, thank you for being here as well today. Tim Selden, Tim, you're here today. Tim is the chair of the IMC and the president of the Monterey Foundation. We are happy to have him with us today. And our very special guest today, Elizabeth Slade. Elizabeth, I have known you for just a couple of years and I've been very, um, thrilled with your work. I've, I've taken some of your, um, well, your coaching course for sure. That's been very helpful to me. And I also um, worked with you a little bit on the teacher uh, education collaborative. So we've had some, some chances to overlap. We also, many of you might have participated either virtually or in person at the Monterey Foundation IMC conference in Sarasota, Florida in November. And Elizabeth was there joining us and we surely hope she'll join us again next year, same weekend in November, but in St. Petersburg, Florida, a new location for us. So uh, Elizabeth, I'm gonna let you introduce a little bit more about your background and yourself here today, um, but I know that you've been an educator for a very long time. I know that you've had um, experience in both public and private Montessori education. And I particularly have been um, thrilled with your book and particularly this Montessori in Action, Building Resilient Montessori Schools. I'd love to know more about this as I'm sure everyone would. I think there's some concepts and things in here that, that we really need to um, pay attention to. So Elizabeth, I'll turn it over to you. Great, Kathy, thank you so much for inviting me today and to all of IMC for hosting me this fall. I do see a few familiar faces um, and even some people that were at my session. So thanks for coming back again. <laughs> um, it's really wonderful to be here. I'm hoping this is just gonna be a lovely collegial conversation, but I did put a few anchor slides together to share. Is that something people would like is to start with some framing for Okay, great. We already practiced the screen share, so yeah. we are ready to go. That always works. And while you're doing that, I'll let everyone know. Of course, if you have comments, please feel free to click the chat button at the bottom. Comments and questions are welcome. And if you raise your virtual hand on the reactions button, we'll be able to pop it up and you can ask Elizabeth a question directly as well. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. I'm gonna start a little bit about my origin story. Um, about where I began. I began um, in Washington, DC. I took my training at the Washington Montessori Institute when it was in DuPont Circle. I wandered in there in my fourth plane of development without a single idea of what I was gonna do with my life. I'd been a sociology theater major, an anthropology women's studies minor. And there I was in the neighborhood was this amazing building and I wandered in and it launched what then would be the next 35 years of my life. Who knew, right? Um, but my first job that I took was on the border of Maryland and Pennsylvania in Westminster in a church where every Friday we packed it away. So Jonathan was talking about what he was doing on Friday night. It could have been packing away a school that's housed in a church, a parent teacher co-op. Uh, and then every Sunday afternoon, I'd go back to the church and um, bring, you know, bring the classroom back out again. Um, and it was a really amazing um, first six to 12 class where I was schooled by the students on how to do Montessori elementary. Um, then there were some health challenges in my family and I moved back to Massachusetts and I worked at another parent teacher co-op, um, which was the Children's Montessori School, which was in a, a stable. It was a converted stable on the grounds of, a, um, it wasn't a convent or a monastery, but it was a religious um, uh, organization that owned the property. 
And there I really had an opportunity to do a startup and to have a take a group of students through six to nine. And then as they grew, we shifted and I went with them to create the nine to 12 program. So I had another whole amazing eye opening um, experience through that. Um, and then in 1999, the first public Montessori school opened in Massachusetts, um, which was Zanetti Montessori. And the principal had observed me teaching at Children's Montessori School and she contacted me. I was actually on maternity leave. Um, and she said, well, so we, the teachers had six weeks of training and I thought that would be plenty. That's, you know, from, from a public school standard, that's a lot of training, but it seems like there's, you know, they need some support. Will you come um, and be their mentor and coach? And that was the beginning of me moving out of the classroom and doing that piece that you do where you have to figure out and make conscious what you were doing in order to be able to talk about it with somebody else. Um, and so I had that experience in Springfield Public Schools. We um, had the opportunity to start a second public Montessori program under a superintendent who was um, impressed by the wait list that grew at Zanetti. Um, sadly, a second superintendent came with a different idea. And um, by that point, I had taken my AMS administrative licensure to get um, Montessori administrative license and my Massachusetts administrative license. So we, we, a bunch of us did this sort of get locked in so that we could protect and insulate the schools. Um, but the new superintendent did something rather clever, which is he just relocated us to traditional schools. And he put traditional leadership into the two Montessori schools. And they of course brought their own staff and their own ideas. Um, and so I didn't want to be an administrator at anything but a Montessori school. And so I then went and worked in Hartford Public Schools. Um, and my first point of contact was bringing the child study approach um, that we had developed in Springfield to Crack Montessori Magnet, which is where I met Jackie Costantino. She was the head of school at that time. Um, and I went on to work at Moylan. It was called Moylan then, now it's called Batch Elder. Um, and then Annie Fisher, and I got to spend five years there. And it was the first time I worked with a school leader who was also Montessori trained. Um, so the principal, John Freeman, um, was elementary trained, and Uma Ramani, who is um, a primary Montessori trainer, was the primary coach, and I was the elementary coach. And that was an amazing experience over those years to really see how we could develop the art of Montessori coaching um, as a way of um, holding the method strong in the public sector, but also really honoring Montessori's vision about transformation of the Montessori educator. That's something that can really get lost in the public sector is that idea that there's both this physical and spiritual needs and the physical and spiritual prepared environment. So that was really quite magnificent. And then Jackie Costantino, who had gone on with her husband, Keith Whitescarver, and gotten a grant from AMS to start the National Center for Montessori in the public sector, invited me to bring Montessori coaching to sort of the national level um, and to start um, spreading the idea. And this is not a new idea. I think it was David Kahn who wrote the original um, guidance for Montessori in public schools. Um, that there had to be a Montessori coordinator, or, you know, I, I think that was the term at the time, that there had to be a person who knew and understood Montessori. You couldn't just plop a Montessori school in um, and have it live and thrive within the culture of a public school without that person. Um, and so I did that for seven years. Um, and then just this um, actually, it's almost two years now, um, some colleagues from there and I started Public Montessori in Action, which is an international organization. And it's looking at, in particular, at access um, for children, families, and educators of the global majority to try to really bring forth Dr. Montessori's vision around um, education as a vehicle for social change. Um, so, um, in that time of working in the public sector, um, I was approached um, and asked by um, Josie Bass publication under Wiley if um, they said, we think it's time, we're, we're an educational press, we think it's time for a book about Montessori. Um, do you want one? And it, it really sort of fell out of my head, the things that I had seen over the previous years in public schools 
um, and in schools in general around what are the things that we need to hold in mind in order to keep a really strong mission and vision. Um, so in this book, and here's the framing piece, that was like the introduction to me and where did this work come from, um, is this idea of a whole school Montessori method that Montessori schools aren't just classrooms and then the school runs like a factory or runs like a corporation, or, um, but the whole entire school is a Montessori learning environment. And so I am, the book is exploring these three core elements of constructivism, that's our method unlike other most educational methods, equity as a really critical piece, especially in the public sector. Um, and then this idea of coaching as being a core element of what holds the school together. Um, and then the, the, the three main components. Um, okay, so here's the, here's the core, this idea of constructivism, this idea of systems thinking, um, that we're a system within a system, um, equity that we're reaching all students and coaching. I know I had to put a coach there. That is where the term comes from, after all. Um, we were originally, it made it into the urban slang dictionary in the 1800s. Um, I don't think they may have written such a thing, but it did appear and it wasn't in sports, oddly, it was in education, that it was somebody that helped people to pass their exams. They sat beside them and saw them through um, to completing their exams. So um, those are the three elements of coaching at the core. And then the, um, the components we call the Montessori O's, um, which is this idea of one school, one whole school united, but not all separate pieces. There's no splitting between Montessori trained and untrained, everybody's impacting the lives of children and families. So how are we all holding together? It's not a matter of, you know, teachers against administration or leaders where we have these shifts and risks, but we are all responsible for that sense of unity around mission and vision. Um, and so watching to be sure all the things that we choose are gonna hold us together and unify us. Um, this, the H in the Montessori O's is this idea of honest talk, right? That we need to be able to speak openly and clearly and honestly. We need to be bringing what's hidden, what we might feel ashamed of or embarrassed about and not willing to share, that we might bring that to the team for greater teaming. Um, and that if there are things that we don't know or see about ourselves, like if I had spinach in my teeth right now with my hidden self view and I didn't know that, um, that we are able to coach and talk into the blind spot. What do we not know about ourselves and how do we grow stronger and serve children and families better if we have other people supporting us to see things about ourselves that we don't yet see. And then the last, the S of the O's is this idea of strong systems. And you are all school leaders. You, you know all of the things I'm talking about, but in particular, I'm likely resonating with the idea that we are as good as our systems, right? Because if we, we don't have our strong systems in place, we can have all the heart and vision, um, but it isn't held together or cohered in any way. And so how are we creating systems that are um, unifying our whole school? Everybody is contributing to these systems. They're not just separate from, but they're part of. Um, and how are we able to have honest talk? Because we have data, we have systems that show um, information. So it's not somebody's opinion, it's a third um, entity where we can say what the, what the data shows us because we have a system for collecting important pieces of information. Um, everything from attendance, where we can have an honest talk with a family about attendance, because we've actually know how many days somebody is late or um, has missed. Same thing with staff, right? That we have these strong systems for collecting data that helps with the honest talk. Um, so that is the basic overview. Welcome to this conversation. Um, I have many more slides because I've been encouraged to build in, um, create a two-day workshop that goes along with the book that sort of unpacks the book, um, partly because can, true confession, and I think this comes from the creating systems in an elementary setting, but I'm a bit of a nut for tools, <laughs> right? That if we're gonna build something, if we're building a resilient school, we're going to need some tools. And so part of um, the book is a connection to a website where all the tools that are 
um, written about in the book, um, you have access to them digitally. So you can like put, take them, change them, take out the parts you like, put in what you want, put your school logo on it um, and just immediately put it into action. That's the action part, big verb there. Um, so that there's no delay in this idea that um, we don't need to all each reinvent the wheel. Every time a new school opens, people don't have to figure it out as though it's for the first time. And if somebody has figured something out, um, sharing it within our community means we're all going to be getting stronger faster because we're not spending time um, trying to develop something, um, spending hours and hours of time that's already been developed. So sharing widely the tools in the book for people to um, make better. I love it when um, particularly coaches will do this. We used to have an in-person um, workshop and uh, uh, at the end of the school year, all the people who were in the virtual workshop would meet and we'd have a little gathering retreat and they would give feedback on the tools and we would make them stronger and better. They'd show what they had done with it, how they used it, how it became better. And so as a community, we're even just improving the tools that we're using um, to streamline them. So that is one idea of the book is how can we connect with each other um, and even connect in community to say, oh, I have a, I have a tool for that, that, that would, you know, improve, or I have a tool like this tool that looks like this, how do we pull those together? Um, so I'm open to having just any kind of general questions. Um, and I know Kathy and Jonathan might have some leading questions. I know there was early talk about the meaning of life, um, which we could get to, should we run out of things to talk about with the whole school Montessori method? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Everything we do is about the meaning of life, really, when you talk about that. So um, I want to just point out that um, Margaret has shared that your podcast is really helpful as well, Monastery in Action. So I want to um, give a shout out in case people are interested in that. And I also put um, a link if people are interested in the book. It's, you know, we're not here just to sell the book, but I think that it's um, personally having used the book and read the book and and worked with Elizabeth in some of um, her coaching work, I know that there are some really important concepts here. And I particularly am um, stuck on this word resilient right now. Um, and, and I think, you know, how profound was that? This book was written prior to the pandemic, prior to you knowing what our monastery community was going to be facing over these couple of years. And so tell me a little bit about how what is it about building resilient schools that you were thinking about then and that now we're putting into our current situation? Such a great question. I wanna say that I needed to edit in a later draft to acknowledge I couldn't have a book coming out in July in a pandemic with, and it would feel like what, how relevant is this? And so at the end of each section, sort of adding what is our, I, we thought of it as new world learning Right? This is our new world and we needed to adapt and adjust and we had new world coaching and we had, you know, a whole new new world tools. Um, and so at the end of each section is sort of new world thoughts about, right, how do we do class placement when we're all virtual? Right? Or how do we do the appraisal process and one that's fair? Um, so that is in there. I was thinking about resilience from the very beginning. Um, and I think the first experience in Springfield where a new superintendent came and basically ended the term of two public Montessori programs mm -hmm. had me thinking about the promises that we make to families about this three year cycle, right? And um, the fact that in public settings, um, Montessori schools aren't that different from traditional public schools where the, um, the highest need schools have the, the least experienced teachers, right? And so if we're gonna be building resilience in our, all of our students, bringing our strength and expertise to that means that we're creating these schools that people wanna teach at, that people wanna be at for a long, long time. The way the school that I taught at for 10 years, there are still teachers teaching there since I have moved on that I was teaching with when they were there. So many small um, private schools have this advantage of, they are resilient because they have this longevity, this long history. They have, the adults are holding these pieces. 
Um, but what I realized is in the public sector, um, the leadership changes so frequently and so quickly that it's, um, it destabilizes the system because the new person comes in and they have a new way of doing it. And now everybody's in readjustment. And then in a couple of years, somebody else is coming in and now we're readjusting again. But if we just had these systems that everybody knew that were in, established and in place across all public Montessori programs, people come, new coming in would only need to serve the systems that were already going on. And the systems are built around Montessori thinking, right? And that sense of three-year cycle and that sense of child at the center of every decision that gets made. And that in itself, if we could reach that far, um, could really support having more resilient schools for really our least resilient schools, for our, our students who need the most um, connection and longevity, um, because you know the the um, research on resilience. Um, one of the main pieces of research was written about the population that Harena Community School was in, which is the poorest neighborhood in my state of Massachusetts. Um, and what it came out with, and this was years before I wrote the book, but resilience was very much on my mind working at Harena, is that um, children were resilient if they had one person who believed in them. Could be a grandmother, could be a neighbor, but often it was a teacher, right? So if we have that one person and we have them for three years, imagine the resilience that we're building in our communities. Anyway, it really had me thinking about the word resilience, about lasting, about what it means to be in this interconnected community and how could, what could the Montessori world do to embrace um, and pull in some stronger senses. We, we, I mean, anybody of who's on this call who's Montessori trained could go to any other country and you could walk into the classroom at the level of which you're trained. And if you spoke the language and maybe sometimes even if you don't, you could give lessons. <laughs> And you could move the, you could move it forward because the pink tower is done in a certain way wherever you are in the world, um, and that is not true about running schools. You know this as school leaders, right? A lot of the things that you know and do, you've had to figure out, right? And sometimes you figured out through your connections to other people. And so how do we get more connected around creating strong and stable ways for schools to run the way we do around how classrooms are run? So that's why resilience was on my mind, even pre-pandemic. Yeah, I think that the, um, the word really, you know, just strikes us all right now, given, given the time period. So I appreciate your, your thoughts on that. And I, I, everything that you're talking about, I, I, I wanna acknowledge that publicly funded programs have unique set of problems mm -hmm. and a unique set of challenges and a, unique, a uniquely different obligation, if you will to um, their communities. And I also want to say that everything that I have heard from you over the past couple of years, everything I have read in the book speaks to me as someone who has spent my entire career in the independent monastery world. Mm -hmm. And I think that what is most relatable to me is having systems and I'm a systems person, so of course that, that attracts me, but, mm -hmm. but having systems that we can rely on independent of um, the time of year it is, or which teachers come in, or what parent expectations are, or the children you happen to get that year, or whatever it is that tends to throw us off track sometimes. Mm -hmm. It tends to say, well, we had that system, but Mm -hmm. You know, we can't really do that because of this. Mm -hmm. Keeping strong systems to me, um, and it is your third point in your layer. And I, and I don't know if that's by design, but I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, you, maybe you can speak to that, but in your O's, the, the one school piece to me does not happen without the other two pieces, the, the honest conversations and the, um, and the strong systems. So do you have a hierarchy to your three um, on the, those monastery O's? Oh, this is such a good question. Um, so I feel almost tempted to take you into some slides, but I wanna say that, um, you know, it's organized around this elementary chart 
of the layers of the earth, right? Mm -hmm. And so the idea that the one school is the ground that we walk on, right? That it is the, it is structurally the earth where we are all. Um, and that honest talk is the water, right? That flow of communication and that it's um, a resource we can't survive without. We can really go without eating for a long time, but we can't go without hydration. Um, but that strong systems is the air. So Kathy, you're absolutely right. It isn't third, it is this essential. It's also right essential for life, but it is the thing that touches all of us, right? Um, and there's a Montessori quotation, I'm just gonna read to you from the 1946 London lectures. When a piece of cloth is to be woven, maybe I'll screen share this so that you can read along with me. Um, when a piece of cloth is to be woven, the warp is prepared first. All the threads lie close together, but parallel to each other. This is like the society by cohesion. They're all fixed at one point, but they do not intermingle. The second stage is when the shuttle attaches all the threads together. This is like the work of the leader who connects all the people together. Yet it is necessary to have the warp, the society by cohesion as a basis or we could not weave a strong piece of cloth. So that's the idea that this is a cloth that we're making. There's not a hierarchy, and one isn't more important than the other. Without them, um, the whole piece doesn't, doesn't go together. The, the math equation version would have multiplication signs where if it's zero in one, it's zero in the whole thing. Right. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I know that um, this is the, your work is very aligned with what um, our philosophy at the Monastery Foundation and IMC is and a lot of what we also teach. And so I, I think about, um, and Tim, you'll, you'll think about this. We always talk about this um, Monastery Mall, right? The shopping mall. You walk into a school and you get to pick, you know, one classroom's J.C. Penney's and the next one's Saks Fifth Avenue. And then you walk down the hall a little bit more, you've got the gap and some new trends are happening. And um, to have to really be able to create that cohesive school where you know you are part of something and you're all in moving in the same direction and maintain the autonomy that most monastery educators treasure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. My classroom. Yeah. So tell me a little bit, have you come across that in your work with, because um, you've worked with so many teachers and leaders, any thoughts about that particular piece? Well, you know, that particular piece started for me in that my journey began where I was an only, I was the only elementary classroom and there was no sense of like community connection, collaboration. Um, and so when I moved into schools where there were more classrooms, realizing that children in the JC Penny Sex Fifth Avenue were getting a very different and inequitable experience based on the one school that I worked at, you know, one of the primary teachers had been working in Montessori as long as I had been alive at that time and owned everything there possibly was. Um, and the classroom next door was a first year teacher, you know, who was, you know, younger than I was. And not to say that their love and their unique touch to it was, um, you know, wasn't making a huge impression, but I realized, oh, this idea of like calibrating and sharing resources and knowledge. And that was like my even pre-coaching idea of like, that that person who's been doing this for my whole life, if they were meeting regularly with the person who was new, what a strength that would be. Um, okay, this is a very like short side line, but I don't know if anybody has been following the new idea of coaching as this um, reciprocal coaching where um, young people, this is not in education, but in business, um, young people are being you know mentored and coached by people who've been in the field for a long time, but it's this sense of reciprocal coaching where they're also bringing the older people into the current world, <laughs> Tech technologically, about implicit bias, about every single thing, right? The Montessori idea of um, that we are all learning. And so the Montessori coaching is very focused on coaching and being coached. Um, mm -hmm. But I think I, I really saw that when I was in the classroom and felt it when I was in the classroom. And then when I became a coach, I was really aware of my task as 
interconnecting so that there wouldn't be such big discrepancies that would land on children, that there were things that a teacher didn't know how to teach and so didn't teach. Well, we've got to fix that, right? <laughs> we have to all, and you know, that's a, that's a growth thing, but in the meantime, how are we supporting? So things like, this is very elementary example, but like um, doing the, the first great lesson together between two classes when that first year teacher is like terrified to actually do it, right? It's like, well, let's, you know, this person's done it 10 times in a row, got the black cloth, they got all the things, you know, how could we create a kit that could go around to all the classrooms so you don't have to go and collect all those things. You're using the kit, you know when each other's doing it. This time I wanna do it, but I wanna to come to yours again. Can I have coverage so I can go watch it again before I give it again? Like, how are we sort of building capacity um, in ourselves and in, our, in every school-based adult? whatever role they're playing, um, because all of that impacts the lives of children. And what we do, it also impacts the sense of community that we all need to feel competent, like we have something to contribute. Um, so I think it is really connected to Montessori schools in general. It's not necessarily just a public thing. Well, most definitely. Um, the, I have many questions. I can keep going all, more, all day long, but I want to um, make sure that we open it up to any of our participants today. If you have questions, please feel free to raise your virtual hand, which is in your reactions button at the bottom. If anyone on our panel would like to uh, uh, chime in, please unmute and feel free to do so. Uh, I know you all have a lot to contribute. This is very um, aligned, as I said, with the work that we do and, and what we've been helping uh, a lot of our members and clients schools with. So um, I, I think it's so important. And I, I think that attitude, um, Elizabeth, that you had naturally perhaps to reach out to mentor, to help, to be mentored, uh, that works really well if you have that attitude. How can we as school leaders develop mm. a culture where that becomes something that is less, that is, that is more the norm and less the feeling of either competition or uh, the fear of vulnerability mm -hmm. of asking for help? Mm -hmm. well, that's a wonderful question. Um, in the book, I talk about this man named Alan Feldman, um, who was a, a new school at um, an independent school. And he'd been a principal at many really fine independent schools, but never at a Montessori school. And so he asked me right out of the gate um, if I would coach him and if I would do weekly coaching sessions with him to unpack and explore the Montessori model, and he made them open to the whole staff. Um, and so once a week after school on a certain day for an hour, we talk about like un demystifying, like what is control of error? You know, like um, what are, you know, all of these in insider terms. And then once a week, at least um, he and I would go and co-observe and then we would debrief. What did you see? You know, helping him interpret and understand. But what, what happened there is he immediately made himself vulnerable to I, I don't know this in front of the staff and invited the staff to come. And very soon, it wasn't my task anymore. Everybody was chiming in um, about different things and bringing antidotes from their classroom. And it was almost like this collective experience of bringing this new head of school into the thinking that there's no insider outsiders. And that was his one school move, right? And it was about exactly that becoming vulnerable instead of coming in and being like, I've been 40 years, I've done many schools, I'm, you know, I'm an expert at this, that, and the other thing. Um, so I, one of the things I think of for school leaders is what are the, what are the things we don't know? And how are we asking for help about those things in a public way that we are receiving coaching right there in front of our teachers that we're built on a method that's about friendliness with error. And how often are we able to name that and let that be um, part of the fabric of our school that we're going to make mistakes. It isn't about whether we make mistakes, it's how do we respond when we do, right? Just like in the classroom, when somebody drops the black paint, that is a sure thing that paint will be spilled. We, um, but it's about what happens next, right? That is the most important thing. So thinking about either your growing edges or your errors, and how do you manage those within your community as a way of modeling for um, the school-based adults, how it, how it is to be friendly with error and self-forgiving um, and how it is to be a learner, to be bringing that, that learning mind 
um, you know, the whole um, Carol Dweck's whole work about um, mindset. Was, I just love thinking about those. Do people know her work about growth mindset? Right. I love thinking about the children that she was working with initially and the ones who didn't want to do the puzzles because they might get it wrong. And I'm thinking it's all the Montessori children who are like, can I take the hard one home? I didn't figure it out yet. <laughs> right. Those are all of our Montessori students. And how can we emulate that? How can we be as brave as the children in our classrooms as tackling things we don't yet know how to do? And we don't feel very competent in yet. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing. I, de I definitely see um, in some of our monastery teachers who've been uh, doing this for a very long time, sometimes we're, we're experiencing the attitude that they're the expert and, and it's not always to be shared. So mm -hmm. I'm just saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm trying to look at what are some of the obstacles to implementing what sounds so simple. The Monastery O's are a wonderful framework, a great way to put this, right? One school, honest conversations or honest talk and, and uh, strong systems sounds very good to me until I run up against that teacher. Yeah, and I would say, Kathy, the number one obstacle for implementing the O's is time. Okay. Right. I don't think there's any community that can't do this. It's really time is the one resource we're all given the exact same amount of. And it's really how we use that time that makes the difference. Right. And so thinking about the first thing that comes to my mind when you're talking about that is lesson study, these idea of a weekly team meeting at level where you're engaged in conversations about our beautiful Montessori practice, right? And that we're, we're affording time to our staff to connect about these things because we understand that is professional development on all of these levels. That is tackling the idea of many of the questions you've already asked get tackled in a weekly level meeting that's not focused on giving news and information about, you know, when's picture day and which parents have, you know, gone through the training to be subs or like that's going to all go in an email. But this meeting is really about today we're going to revisit the decimal checkerboard. <laughs> you know, Tanya is was doing doing it in her classroom. I've asked her if she'll present it to the rest of us so we can get a refresher because it's been a while. We haven't seen that out in the school in quite some time. Mm -hmm. You know, let's get this back. Or maybe it's in, you know, primary saying, let's go into Jonathan's room and let's look at the way he's organized his language shelf for right now. We know that we're, you know, children have come in with fewer skills because of the pandemic. Let's look at what Jonathan has done to organize the layout, moving from spoken to written to, to reading to support that, right? So how are we structuring our time that we have to do just that, just what we're saying? So it's about not having a say do gap, right? Which is the idea that you say, oh, we believe in one school, honest talk and strong systems. But what you do is you create a schedule and a structure that keeps everybody in their rooms separate from each other without time to cohere or talk that there's no system in place to bring them all together mm -hmm. so i think the number one thing is to look at how time is spent at your school mm -hmm. and to figure out if those three things are values or even one of them is then where's the time invested to show that that is one of the biggest school values um, and how is that lived out so, and I think that's even a bigger thing topic this year because with, you know, people being sick with COVID and coverages and just the, the level of stress on educators, um, the, the idea of time um, is becomes, can, yeah, can become a very stressful topic. It, it is very stressful, particularly right now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that what we have tried to do over these past couple of years in, in these kinds of forums is think about, how do we maintain who we are, the integrity of our programs, um, our own sanity and, and self-preservation in, in spite of um, perhaps the challenges that, that are in the outside world? Because it, we can't just say, well, it's COVID, so all of our values, beliefs, and practices just can't apply anymore, right? So we all have to kind of hold together and and continue to support each other in elevating and, and staying with some of these things. Um, Elizabeth, the, um, the thing you mentioned about time and investment, I, 
I hear from heads of schools and I ha have had this experience myself, I have to say, I, on an open house giving a school tour and I'm saying, here's what we do. And then I open a classroom door and we're not doing it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or we're doing something very different yes. than I just said. <laughs> so I really, I, I really think marrying the say and the do is a really important piece of how we can you know, help the staff recognize that what they're doing and what we're saying, you know, that just has to, to have some cohesion, right? There has to, this has to fit together. Mm -hmm. So I, I really appreciate that. I'm going to give some thought to uh, how we can help schools in that, in that particular area, because I hear that fairly regularly. You won't believe I was on the school tour, what I saw. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know, everybody gets off track sometimes. We understand that. It's not to open the door and catch someone doing something wrong is not my point at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. So hey, I'm going to invite um, all of our participants, please, please. I know I'm the one asking a lot of questions. I love this work and the, and the book. So I'd love to hear your comments and your questions. Um, generally, you're not very shy, so um, go ahead. And, Renee, and, uh, is, Renee is at the ready. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. We also have a couple of comments there. Margaret, um, really important. And I'm so glad Margaret Whitley is here with us today. She says, I'm no longer ahead of school, but I think the importance of systems thinking also applies to our organizations. I agree. And the intersections of many organizations. Like public Montessori, every time we have change of people in our organizations, the systems need to be in place regardless of who is leading them. Let's strive to use the elementary chart of layers of the earth or the loom for our global Montessori community. And I, I just think organizationally, um, Margaret, I'm going to say, I think that we're sort of in the infancy of learning this um, from a Montessori organizational perspective mm -hmm. and to be able to have those organizations intersect in a way that there are set systems in place regardless of the leadership. The, the, really, the organization should be, as a school, is independent mm -hmm. of that, um, that leadership. So yeah. I, I really appreciate the thoughtfulness in that. So Kathy, um, Renee raised her hand. I want to hear her oh, question, I missed but, that. I, but, I, but I do want to say to what you said that it's helping me think about what you were talking about in schools where teachers might be reticent to share and they might feel a sense of competition. I think that happens in our wider Montessori organizations as though we have a scarcity mindset mm -hmm. rather than this abundance mindset um, and this willingness to be generous and share with each other. Um, and I also want to say as somebody who started a new Montessori organization, organization, I have been deeply humbled by the generosity of other Montessori organizations in welcoming um, a new organization in. And I'm ready, Margaret, to sign up for the let's all do it together in the same way way. <laughs> I hope you'll lead the charge. Let's hear what, Renee, what was your yeah. question? Thank you, Elizabeth. It's great to see you. Um, I think I was just thinking about commenting on your talking about time, but also mindset. I think mindset is really, really big and it really is the culture of a school. And if I can share one example, we created a, this is a lot of years ago, but something that we wrote up called, we're all a community of learners. And the same way that the children work because we used to use it for the students. Um, and because what I found is a lot of Montessori teachers are scared of the materials when they're new and young. Mm. and need to see people you know and I just remember the one with racks and tubes was like everybody came to that one mm -hmm. and you know when I was saying, well you're in preschool and oh but I still I remember seeing this once and I have no idea if I could ever do it and but then it created a culture where they could go to each other you know a little more individual but we we set that up on a weekly basis of we just called it let's do Montessori and a teacher would volunteer and bring her own material Mm -hmm. And I just let them do it because why did she pick that one? There must be a reason, right? Mm -hmm. And then it created, and, and, and basically what, what it was really saying is it's okay to be a learner, meaning it's okay if you don't remember how to do this, right? And well, it, there's, no one's going to judge you on that. Yeah. Right? And full disclosure to everyone else in this group, I had the privilege of working with Renee and her school 
community to do one of the things that's in the book, which is creating these transition touchstones to decide where do we want all the children to be at the end of primary? What do we need yeah. them to know and be able to do in order to seamlessly transition into lower L and not feel like, ah, I don't know how to do any of these things, right? And then asking the lower elementary team the same question, what do children need to know? And having each level look back on it. So upper L looks and says, yeah, that's, um, and that's a really valuable and um, rich, healthy process. And the reason that came to mind when you were talking about that, Renee, is I remember, um, working with lower elementary on that. And they were talking about um, math facts and upper elementary was like, that's a deal breaker. You know, like they yep, can't yep. come in and not know those things or they're, they're sort of like children that come to elementary that don't know their letter sounds. We're just sort of, we're starting out behind. And I remember the team at the time was like, that's not possible. But you had one <laughs> teacher who was new, not new to Montessori, but she was new to your school. And she said, oh, last year, all my children left knowing their facts and they all jaw dropped. They were like, what, how did you do that? And I remember she coached them over the year. And by the end of the year, some enormous percentage of your students moving from lower to upper left knowing their facts from like dubious educators who'd been doing it for a while yep. that were transformed by the power of one person saying, oh, it's completely possible. And she had come from a public Montessori program that wasn't necessarily from affluent families. And so they were like, okay, we're on. Show us, starts with the counting chains, what? Okay. Um, so, you know, what, what you're talking about, that opportunity for teachers to be learning with and from each other is also about how you elected to have them spend some of their time thinking and talking to each other. So just yeah. kudos back to you on that. Well, and, and you did it because you, you're the one who came in, but that was a turning point for the school's growth and retention. Mm -hmm. It was a big turning point because then we had consistency and clarity. Mm -hmm. so, but thank you again, Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ooh. I, I love that story that um, someone knew that the new, their new idea was accepted into it, even though the other teachers, you know, perhaps felt like, well, that's just really not possible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to look at what is possible, sometimes we get a mindset, right? Yep, yep. This is the way it is, this has been our experience, and so I know. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to move from I know to I'm curious, I wonder, that those, mm -hmm. those are the kinds of um, mm -hmm. attitudes, I think, mm -hmm. we're looking for and, and bring up. Or I forget, show me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. okay, too, right? <laughs> yeah, and so, one of those teachers went on to become a public um, Montessori teacher and is now a Montessori coach. Um, Absolutely. Yep. So I'm... yeah, those, those many moments that become sort of transformative and amplify. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, just like um, classroom teachers, sometimes we don't know our impact that we have on children as school leaders. We don't know the impact that we might have on our school-based adults and how yep. they think of themselves and what's possible. So mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Other uh, comments or questions for Elizabeth? I, I'm not seeing if you're, let me go into a different gallery view so I can see if you're. Aunt, Kathy, Angie has a question in the chat. Thank and I don't you. know if she'd like to ask it out loud. Angie oh, Souls. Yeah, Angie, do you want to unmute and ask about that? Or I can read. I'm looking sure, for sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I was having something to eat. <laughs> um, I um I was just wondering in your book does it speak much to adolescence? So it doesn't speak necessarily to any of the levels specifically because we're thinking about it from the biggest picture. We're on the balcony. We're not down mm -hmm. down in there. Everything that is in the book could be done with teams of any level, right? So it's really the idea um, and the tools, some of the tools go through adolescence, like the, um, the touchstones actually go through um, high school. We have um, transition touchstones for um, getting students ready to go into high school and then thinking if you have a Montessori high school, what do you want them? Um, but a lot of the tools are, I don't want to say generic, that makes it sound like not important, but um, interchangeable. Um, the, the few that aren't, one is the observation tool. Obviously you're not gonna observe the first plane of development 
and a second and a third with the same lens, there's going to be shifts in how you're going to look at it. Um, so when that's true, adolescence is included, and that's not really the main thrust of the book. So if you're reading it, looking for more information about adolescence, it's probably the wrong book. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. Any other thoughts, uh, questions for Elizabeth? Okay. So Elizabeth, tell us what, what would be your takeaway from this? Um, what, what do you hope as you research this book, as you, as you wrote it, what, what's your hope for uh, its impact in the monastery community? Well, I think my, one of my hopes was just realized in this comment with Margaret, which is the idea that we all kind of wake up to the idea of each other as a big resource and we begin doing deeper and more collaboration. So the more people who read the book, um, the more people who are taking um, a system or an idea, had a, um, a principal reach out to me um, over after the holidays saying, I just spent the holidays, read your whole entire book, you know, here are the pieces that I want to implement and here's what I have to offer. So how is this like going to become uh, something that is continues to be fueled? I'm toying with the idea of adding on the website tools that aren't mentioned in the book when there's like special subsection of like, and this from other people or, and you know, these newly coming in. Um, because I think that, that my, really my biggest hope is that it's not so difficult. Like this is our cosmic task. This is our chosen work. This is such, dude, so delicious. Let us not be banging our heads because we're missing um, key things that make the whole thing possible, right? And so how are we generously sharing with new schools starting up? Very another very quick story, but when the first Montessori school opened in Springfield, um, the um, head of the private school in the area reached out to me to say, you know, what can I do to support? And at that time, um, Zanetti was children whose families didn't enroll them in any other school in the city. So there was a high um, number of children with incarcerated parents or in foster care or in absent parents. And, um, I recognized I had a um, my, son, my old son who's now 26 um, was seven at the time and he was having trouble being an emerging reader. He was loved reading and I was working with he and this child Rosa at Zanetti. And I realized that Isaac knew words like pasture, right? He, he knew all, you know, he, he knew mushroom cap. He knew all of these words, prairie um, and um, the, the child at Zanetti did not have that vocabulary. And part of that was because she didn't own any books. She didn't have a single book in her house. So the head of the, so I said to her, okay, so I know you guys do book orders, right? Where you send out book orders and children can buy books from Seesaw or Scholastic or whatever. Um, and so she, we created this thing called the book share where families were encouraged to buy an extra book and put it in the Zanetti box in the front every single month. So every single month I'd stop at the school and get this big box of books and bring it to school and give it away to children that we knew didn't have any books. And that went on for years, right? That sense of, of collaboration and interconnectedness. And I'm wondering like, how could we do that with new schools, new Montessori organizations, Margaret, like how could we have a welcome way of saying, you don't have everything you need to survive, to thrive in the way we hope you will. Here's, here's how we welcome you into this work. Um, knowing everybody on this call is impacting, you know, tens of hundreds of children, right? Anywhere from 10 children to a hundred children to hundreds of children through the work that you do. Um, and so, how will the book be able to possibly create some seismic waves towards unity? Even as you said, Kathy, like all the classrooms will be different. All the schools will have their own flavor, but what are our points of unity um, that hold us together? Yeah, Tim. Yeah, thank you. I, I've kept very silent because you've been doing a beautiful job and I love the conversation. One of the things that, um, maybe a little bit more conversation as we wrap up would be how do we help, how do we use the idea of resilient schools, the building of a sense of buy-in and community to try to marshal the political power of the teachers and the stakeholders to keep the school board 
and the superintendent and the administration on track, because that's where the usual breakdown occurs. The other thing, as we all know, is uh, three years after we start a new public school and teachers begin to disperse for one reason or another, there's usually not money to get new teachers trained. And so you start ending up with some sort of in-house training that may or may not be enough. By the way, though, I would love your coaching metaphor and the fact that you're doing the kind of head coaching you're doing. John, Kathy, I, many of us do it. It is so vital. Yeah. So glad to hear more people are doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that goes to the piece about Montessori organizations like MPPI. And I think, Kathy, did you mention this just to me or was it the front of the call with everyone? Anyway, um, the Montessori Public Policy Initiative is doing just that. Like, how are we, instead of having everybody figured out for themselves, how are we all staying connected to their work as they're pushing the edge in all of these different states, as they're keeping track of the Build Back Better um, piece of it, as they're holding us. And so that we don't all have to run out and figure all that out. We just all need to stay connected to MPPI and build and support their network so that they can continue feeding the rest of us. And I, I'm thinking a lot actually about, um, you know, sort of the evolution of um, Montessori and how we are going to be able to differentiate in order to serve um, and, and not duplicate or replicate. Like if someone's already doing something, I, um, I was at the IMC conference and I was uh, after Jonathan, after your workshop with Michael Dorr, which I didn't get to do the whole thing because I was presenting on the second half of it, hitting him up and saying, no one's doing anything about classroom management. Get out, you know, like this needs to be a thing that reaches everybody because people are always asking me about this and you and Jonathan already have it locked in, right? Like, let's like make this beyond this conference conference, how can we make this available? And so I think it's about like that kind of honest talk within the organizations to like, who's going to do what, you know, um, and you know, who, who has that level of expertise and then we can send everybody to that place to do that thing. So we can do many, many more things. And I think MPPI in terms of policy and being on top of those pieces, um, they have such a great strong team and they've come to a number of different meetings that I've sponsored to share what they know and get more information out there. There, so very generous also. Yeah, and, and bring, it's interesting you bring up MPPI. We are going to have them as guests um, on our upcoming webinar. They're very interested in um, sharing their work here. We collaborate with them, obviously, as well as with MACT, with AMI, with um, AMS, of course, uh, MEPI, all the different organizations. Um, it's, it's essential that we collaborate and share our ideas, our resources, our thoughts, and and there are duplications of efforts. That's the fact. And mm -hmm. we want to look at how do we, um, you know, reduce that and or just support each other. If we are doing similar things, then let's look at how we, you know, lift everyone, right? And, and I think that that's really the, uh, the key. Uh, yeah. And, oh, and um, the, the Massachusetts, uh, I'm not going to say this correct. The, the Massachusetts, the Massachusetts schools of Montessori. Montessori schools of schools Massachusetts. Of Massachusetts. <laughs> Montessori schools of Massachusetts is having their uh, their gathering this weekend, right? This coming. We, no, sorry, we had it last Saturday. And, last um, Saturday. And, yeah, and okay. MPPI presented, and they did a fabulous job. And it's just what you said. It was like all of us are struggling to keep that information in our heads. Yeah. And you know, and that could be something we could call a silver lining from the pandemic, right? That getting everybody on a Zoom yes. um, and giving everyone consistent information that we now really understand it, it was mm -hmm. just really well done. And it was done in 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, we will have them on as well. We do work with them very regularly and the um, yep. sorry, leaders of the different organizations, uh, whether formally or informally, do mm -hmm. um, gather and talk and, collaborate um, behind the scenes and we need to do more sharing of that out to the Montessori community. So everyone is aware of what's happening in those areas. So um, there's been groundbreaking work over the past, I'd say 10 years, wouldn't you say, Tim? Yep. About 10 years of, <laughs> of collaboration uh, that has, you know, challenges here and there, but uh, certainly the intention is to uh, have one voice uh, for mm -hmm. Montessori. 
Uh, Denise, did I see your hand up or are you just, uh, okay, well, good to see you. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much. As Jonathan said, you're, you're sharing your, this is transformative work. It's aligned with everything that we are doing and that's part of our effort to reach out and continue to bring um, faces and voices and information to the Monterey community. So on behalf of IMC and the Found Monterey Foundation, we're very happy you were able to come today and share with us. Kathy, thank you so much. And thank you, Tim. I want to everybody who's still here and didn't have to leave to know that I actually sent Kathy after I heard this podcast of these two women who co-wrote an article together, one, an older one and one brand new to the field, that I felt like that educator, that, that writer. So grateful to you, Kathy, for taking me in. I know I'm not that young, but as a young organization to feel so embraced by IMC um, and your, your gracious inclusion of me in the IMC conference and all the ways that you've brought me in and so grateful to you and Tim and Jonathan, and Tanya, the whole group. Um, thank you so much for your support. Really appreciate it. Well, the IMC and the foundation are delighted to have you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.